Thank you very much. I'm going to tell you a, a story about how I got into what I do. I'm a writer. I write books, biographies that are sort of in-depth portraits that are of people that walk the fine line between genius and madness, and all of whom were obsessive. So I'm going to tell you a bit about how I got into this. In grade school, I was known as the science and math guy. If my friends wanted to know what a black hole was, they turned to me. If someone mentioned a three-digit number, say 153, I could tell them something special about it. I mean, 153, well, it's the smallest number that's the sum of the cube of its digits. When my friend's mom made pineapple jello and it didn't congeal, it was just soup, she turned to me for an explanation, and I could tell her that it was the presence of protolytic enzymes in the pineapple that denatured the gelatin proteins, and that's why it didn't coagulate. I was Mr. Rational then, and I believed that science could explain everything. I got into science by default. My dad was a literature professor. He was a speed reader. He could read three books a day and did. And he also had a photographic memory for everything he read. I mean, he could quote. I'm sure he was a great teacher because he could quote all of Shakespeare, all of Chaucer, all of Nabokov, and relate all their ideas. But as a kid, I found this really intimidating. I mean, I couldn't even discuss with him a book like Charlotte's Web. Without him pointing out some unexpected motivation of the pig, <laughs> I mean, I wanted to be the very best at something too. So I stopped reading fiction, I stopped reading entirely, and I took up science because my dad wasn't very good at it, and also math and chess because he wasn't good at that either. When I entered Harvard in 1974, I decided I was going to be a physicist. I wanted to unravel the deep secrets of everything in the physical world, but there was a problem. It was my freshman roommate. When he was back in high school, he was part of a team of physicists who had discovered a new subatomic particle. So, on my high school resume, chess club. On his resume, discovered fundamental particle of nature. I mean, I decided that there wasn't enough room in physics for him and me. <laughs> Now, during summers at Harvard, he went back to the particle accelerator. I mean, that's what you did at Harvard. I mean, during summers, you smashed atoms together. Or you interned at the New York Times, or you went to South Africa and vaccinated small children. In other words, you did something elite and prestigious that would help you in your future career. Well, I didn't know what my future career was going to be, and besides, these prestigious internships didn't pay anything, and I needed to make money. So I went to New York City that summer, and I got the highest-paying job I could. I became a doorman on the Upper East Side. Now I lived with my father that summer. I'm a child of divorce. I'd only seen him on weekends, so I was really looking forward to that. I thought I'd get to know him. Also, I mean, here he was. He lived this kind of bohemian life as a professor in Greenwich Village, and he had this great apartment. I thought it would be really fun. But the first day there, I felt oddly competitive with him, and we went for a walk in Washington Square Park, and the drug dealers came up to him and not me. I mean, he was 40 years older than me and had better hipster credentials. Now this building I worked in on the Upper East Side—it was large and swanky. I mean, there were two men that worked the door. There was also a large staff of people that were the elevator operators in the in the lobby, and also freight elevator operators. I mean, all these guys were Yugoslavian, and I was filling in for one of them on vacation. They were all really sweet. They were nice. They were very polite to all the people in the building. For me, though, the job was a bit of. Bait and switch. I mean, I was only at the door for an hour or two a day, and the rest of the time I had to be in the elevator. I was an elevator operator to wear this starchy uniform, and I was instructed to face the corner of the elevator, wedge myself unobtrusively into the corner, supposed to know where everybody in the building lived. I was instructed not to talk to them first unless they spoke to me. Of course, they did because I mean, I was a curiosity, a college kid among middle-aged Yugoslavians, and a Harvard kid at that. So people did talk to me. Now, down in the basement of the building was a locker room where we changed from our street clothes into our uniforms. And above the lockers was kind of a museum of embarrassing objects that the doorman had fished out of garbage cans of the residents in the building. And each object was labeled with the name of the resident and the apartment number. So I remember the first. Object was a restraining order against the dentist that lived in the building. The second object was a copy of Playgirl magazine, and it said Jeffrey Beamer, apartment 7E. 
And then next to that was a, a huge dildo. And it was Irene West, and she lived in, in the penthouse. Now, I was amused by this, but I was also horrified because friends of mine lived in doorman buildings, and I wondered, did they realize that these obsequious doormen were mocking them behind their backs? <laughs> and in my building, the mocking extended in a lot of other ways. Whenever a beautiful, smartly attired woman walked by the building, the doorman would say, he would smile and say in a sweet, cheerful voice, Pichka, and often the woman would smile back, unaware that Pichka was Yugoslavian for whore. Now, the deception in the building also extended to the residents themselves. I mean, there was one night when I had to work an onerous double shift. I mean, 16 hours in that damn elevator. And at about midnight, I was summoned to the seventh floor. This woman summoned me. The doors opened. She wasn't there, but there was this tray, and on the tray was a glass of red wine and two lobster tails prepared by her chef. And I thought, this was really nice. She knew I was working a double shift and that I was hungry. This was great but I also realized that it was hush money, because she had a gentleman caller that was spending the night there while her husband was away. Now, I lost my innocence that summer. I mean, I realized that I couldn't take things at, at uh, face value. I had a lot of time in the elevator to ponder alternative careers to physics. <laughs> and for a few weeks, I thought I would become an ACLU lawyer. I was going to argue freedom of speech cases before the Supreme Court. I was very fond of the ACLU because years ago, my father had turned to them for advice to get me reinstated in school. Because in, fifth, in first grade, I was kicked out of school as a militant six-year-old atheist who refused to say the words under God when we said the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> so one evening, it was the evening before I took my LSATs, I came home to my dad's apartment, he wasn't there, I walked in his office, and there on his desk was a thick manuscript called How Not to Raise Your Child to Be a Lawyer. I started to look at this thing, and my dad walked in, and I said, what the hell is this manuscript? And he said, what are you doing snooping in my office? I said, I'm always in your office, Dad, I'm always there. And he goes, no, you shouldn't have looked at that. And I said, come on, it's sitting right on top of your typewriter. I mean, what the hell is this? And he said, I don't know. And I said, what? It's, you know, in the same type font of your typewriter, it's your, it's your paper. I mean, did you write this? What is this? And he said, no, I didn't write it. And I got more animated. I was really angry. And he would always respond in this sort of calm, collected voice that just drove me all crazier. And finally he said, well, maybe I wrote it. I said, maybe? What the fuck does that mean? I mean, you either wrote it or you didn't write it. And he goes, well, I wrote it, but I'm ghostwriting a book for a very famous female attorney who doesn't want anyone to follow her into the profession. So the book is her view, not mine. In fact, I think you'd make a very good lawyer because you're so argumentative. <laughs> now, I know what you're thinking. I mean, you're thinking, okay, my dad was lying, you know, that was obvious, you know, he probably didn't want me to be a lawyer, so he cooked up this crazy stunt. Well, that wasn't what I was thinking at the time. I mean, I held my dad up on a pedestal. And if he said, you know, the dog ate my homework, I believe that the dog really did. So the next day, I was taking my LSATs, and as I sat there, I realized, like, this was just too much of a coincidence. This manuscript appears the, the day before I'm taking my LSATs, and I started to replay in my mind all the dozens, maybe even hundreds, of convoluted stories that he had told me during his life, all of which I had thought were true until that very moment, and I realized that they were all false. My dad loved to tell me stories about his um, athletic success, his youthful athletic success. And he claimed that when he was at the University of Wisconsin, he was the national heavyweight champion in his collegiate div division. So one of my college roommates had actually tried to look my dad up in the book, and of course my dad wasn't there. And when I confronted my dad about this at the time, he looked really sad and he said, it was a horrible miscarriage of justice. I won, but the referee was befuddled, and for a nanosecond, he raised the other guy's hand, and then he realized what he had done, but it was too late. It went down in the record books that way. It was a miscarriage of justice. <laughs> and I realized then, as I was taking my LSATs, that the story wasn't true. I mean, so many of the stories my dad told me involved fake manuscripts. I was a tournament chess player in junior high school. I played, I would come to New York and stay with him and play in tournaments. And I was playing in the National Junior High School Championship, and I came home, and there on my father's dining room table was this yellowing, Freudian psychoanalytic paper from the 1930s about the motives of chess players. 
And of course, it was an Oedipal interpretation of what motivated chess players, and it said, the aim of chess is to kill the father. And kill the father was like highlighted with a yellow magic marker. <laughs> and I said to my dad, what is this? He said, you shouldn't have seen that. I go, well, what? You just left this out. He goes, I don't know what that is. Of course, I found a yellow magic marker across the room. Um, around that time, too, my father decided to write the great American novel. Now, his friends, his professor friends, thought this might really be possible. I mean, here he was, a brilliant teacher who knew by memory every great novel. So why couldn't he just synthesize them and do one of his own? He took a year off from his work. He worked on the novel. I mean, I saw him doing this. So I came to visit him one weekend in New York, and my father looked terrible, the worst I'd ever seen him. I said, what's the matter? And he said, someone broke into my apartment, and they stole a lot of stuff. They stole my typewriter and I kept the manuscript of the novel on top of the typewriter in the typewriter case. It was gone. So we spent the weekend going around the village to pawn shops. Couldn't find it. We went to coffee shops and laundromats and you know, put up reward notices and stuff like that. And my dad was depressed for, for weeks about this, I remember. I'd never seen him worse. So as I sat there taking my LSATs, I realized that the story wasn't true that my dad must have been unhappy with the novel, that it wasn't turning out to be the great American novel, and he must have thrown it out and made up this story to, to cover that up. And my father was incredibly talented, but I saw that you know, he wanted to be the best at everything. He had to be the best boxer, not just a boxer. He had to be the best novelist, not just a novelist. And then the proctor said, pencils down. And I looked down with horror in my exam, and I had only marked two questions. It's a multiple choice exam. I mean, I was used to getting perfect scores on standardized tests. I mean, I was distraught. I was really upset. I got up and I walked out of the, the test hall. And shortly thereafter, this like clarity overcame me. And I realized that, you know, I was free. I didn't have to be the very best, that I'd always wanted to be a writer, that I could do it without competing with my dad, and that I was going to be a writer. And I went on to derive great enjoyment, not from being a scientist, but from writing about the geniuses that do science. And then I started reading fiction again. I had to catch up on all that stuff I should have read as a kid. You know, I read Catcher in the Rye and Lord of the Rings. And you know, fiction's pretty good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>